Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review, where in these videos we take a sampling of about eight used firearms that have come into our store and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff that is out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be educational and entertaining. I am not making this video to market or sell you anything. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, guys, jumping into this, remember the format is we start off with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. So in the number one spot is a Taurus Spectrum. I actually don't think I've had one of these on these videos yet. This is a 380 single stack firearm. Uh, Taurus would release this about a year and a half to two years ago with an entry price of about $250 to $300. Now they've stabilized new at about $200, used at about $100 to $150 under normal circumstances. Of course, prices are elevated. Now I got some comments about this. Yes, I do mention the elevated price points as well as the standard price points on these on every single firearm. I'm sorry if the redundancy is annoying to you, but the point is, is these videos will hopefully be around in four, five, six years, and there will be people who are watching those these videos then who are not watching them now who might not understand the current climate that we are in. So by giving both price points, it makes the video data more relevant for the future. If that bothers you, you're probably in the wrong place, but I will continue to give you current data on the elevated pricing as well as where they should be. Also, people like to know how much the current market is affecting their firearm pricing, where they started and where they are now. So that's why I give you guys that data moving forward. So the Taurus Spectrum is actually a striker fire pistol, but it has a trigger pull weight of a double action. And basically how that is achieved is as you pull the trigger, you're moving up a sear arm right through the frame that snags the firing pin and draws it to the rear. And as you get to the height of that trigger pull and before the break, what's happening is that arm is dropping down enough to release the striker, which then of course goes forward and hits the back of the primer. So you get a very heavy, what feels like a double action pull on a striker fired pistol, okay? Heavier than what you would get typically where the you bring the slide back, it locks the striker to the rear and just by pulling the trigger, you're dropping uh, the, the striker to allow it to move forward under spring tension. This, as you pull, you're actually retracting it under its spring tension and then releasing it. So it gives you a little bit of that, that heavier trigger pull. Now, of course, for accuracy, that's not going to be your friend, but this is a concealed carry up close and personal deep concealment backup or like a summertime carry where you're gonna be closer than seven yards in most cases when you're using something like this. Of course, low unadjustable sights as well. So that, that accuracy, that match trigger is not really necessary in a package like this, but that extra added weight, especially on something that does not have a manual safety like the Spectrum, um, it is good again for that safety feature there, especially if you're carrying with one in the chamber. Now, now, the name Spectrum comes from the different uh, color palette, the spectrum of colors that these come in, which is sort of its, its gimmicky attributions in the market. So for all those people that want to customize the different uh, grip color to the slide color to the little panel insert colors, everything from pink to purple to blue to silver to black, it's all there. Um, and so you can get that sort of customized feel in your concealed carry option. So. Um, you know, they haven't been very popular sellers here in our store. The TCPs and LCPs and Smith & Wesson bodyguards have really dominated in this space, the Deep Concealment 380 uh, pocket gun. We did carry them right when they released, but they were never really fast movers here. Um, again, with all the stuff that you see included, you know, the five magazines, or I guess there's four magazines, um, you know, about $200 in today's market is about what this would sell for. So anyway, there you go, Taurus Spectrum. All right, up next I have a couple of very popular rifles. I'm sure you guys have seen at your local gun stores or gun shows from time to time, but this is the SKS rifle. Now it would go into development under Sergei Simonov in 1943 in uh, Russia, and then of course would hit production and enter service in 1945. Now in Russia, it would not really see any type of large scale or prominent military usage as the AK-47 would come on board just a few years later. Now, in this configuration, there were a few countries that you're most commonly gonna find these issued by, of course, Russian, here I have a Chinese, and then Yugoslavia, and those are the three main ones. Now, there were some spinoff, as you can see, like inspired rifles that were inspired from the SKS concept, like uh, the Rashid out of Egypt, the VZ-52 out of Czechoslovakia, our current day Czech Republic, um, 
the Albanian SKS. So there are some close related things, but out of this traditional model, you're typically gonna find Chinese, Yugoslavian, and Russian on the market. Now this one here is a Russian, it is a refurb. You can tell it's a refurb very quickly by seeing the dipped blue bolt, if you will. It's typical of a Russian refurb. Uh, as they were originally produced, it would have looked like this, kind of the stainless, uh, unfinished look, if you will. Now this was sort of common to what you see on Russian captured uh, K98s that you guys have seen in my recent weekly used gun review videos. Blade bayonet was typical uh, Chinese. You would typically find a spike bayonet. They did issue them with blade bayonets as well. Now, as far as military usage, the most common or a common reference or where you most prolifically see the SKS military use would be by the North Vietnamese in the Vietnam War. And typically they were using these, the Type 56 Chinese SKSs or Norinco SKSs is most commonly what you would see is this rifle. Now, price point wise, they're going to vary. If we just look at Chinese, Yugoslavian, and Russian, the Russian are going to be the most valuable, followed by the Yugos, followed by the Chinese, mainly because the Chinese are most commonly found in the United States today. In fact, there are a lot of importers like Classic, uh, usually coming in through PW Arms that are that are selling these right now. Uh, the Chinese SKS is in good matching condition. You find anywhere from about, uh, let's say, with the bayonet, probably about three to four hundred dollars uh, conservatively. Uh, the Russians are going to be at the top in all matching, unrefurbed condition. I've seen them sell as, as high as $900 or $1,000. Typically though, six to eight is about right. Refurbed, you're seeing between about five and six. And then on the Yugoslavian, you're right there in the middle. Typical matching condition Yugo SKSs are about, you know, in the four to $600 range, depending on do they have the grenade launching adapter. And that's that's one big thing about a Yugo SKS is the grenade launching adapter that you find on the 50, oh gosh, I'm trying to go off memory here. The standard 50, I think they called it the 56. Uh, I'm gonna have to put some some inlays down here at the bottom because I don't know off the top of my head. I think it's the basic 56 that looks like this. And it was a 48 or 66 or something like that. I'm, yeah, I'll lay them down here at the bottom for you guys. But anyway, um, those are going to be in the middle. The, the variation, whichever it is, that does not have the gradient launcher on it typically goes for just a little bit more. But 762 by 39 fixed 10 round magazine. Companies like Tapco make a detachable uh, 30 round mag. I've never been a fan of those. Uh, different companies make polymer stocks if you want to turn them into more of a modern rifle. But for the price point, they are a lot of fun to shoot. 762 by 39 is always available and inexpensive. Even now during the ammo shortages, I can still find 762 by 39 at an affordable price. They're just a lot of fun. If your state allows 762 by 39 for hunting, they make a great hunting rifle. So anyway, definitely recommend taking a look at an SKS if you see one. They are a lot of fun to shoot, collect, and own. All right, up next, I have a Smith & Wesson Model 18-7 Combat Masterpiece chambered in 22. It features a six round capacity cylinder, wood grips, blued finish, four inch uh, tapered barrel. So interesting thing about the Combat Masterpiece. The original Combat Masterpiece would come out in 1948 to be a follow-on to the K-22 Masterpiece, which is essentially the same firearm with a 6-inch uh, target barrel. Of course, you have the target features on the Model 18 as well, the Combat Masterpiece, including a target, hammer, and trigger. Now, this would stay in production with Smith & Wesson until 1985 when it would be discontinued and then was brought back as part of the Smith & Wesson Classic Series, which is what this is, with a lock and everything like that that, of course, Smith & Wesson collectors don't like. Now, the price point on these used uh, in this condition in the box, and this is excellent, is probably about the $600 mark. The original, if you have an original 18, an early dash model, of course, a pre-lock pre-1985 when they were discontinued. Uh, with the original box in excellent condition, those are going you know north of $1,000 right now. So the collectability on those is definitely getting higher. Now, the Model 18 was basically the 22 version of the Model 15, so which was a 38 special. So it is a full frame, full weight revolver, uh, same weight and balance as something like the Model 15 that you can use to train and not spend or use all of your expensive ammunition. So um, very, very nice feel, very nice look. Um, of course, they don't quite hold up to the classics, of course, the grips. The grips are nice, uh, you know, the, the frame lock hole. The original barrels were actually hand tapered, so so uh, if you actually got down to a very close sort of microscopic level, you could actually see a little bit of a difference in the contours of each barrel. So they all sort of had their own signature because they were all uh, hand finished. That was the era of the Colt Python and things like that where custom, you know, master gunsmiths would, would 
finish these things off and they just have their own unique spin and look to them, which is really hard to replicate in today uh, in today's uh, manufacturing with the pricing of uh, labor plus the advances in CNC machining and everything, which these are all uh, turned by machines and that sort of thing. So. Anyway, really nice firearm. It's really cool to see something like this come in. It's, of course, the original classic Model 18 Combat Masterpiece uh, would be nice to have, but there's definitely still a place for a Smith & Wesson Classic Series revolver like this for those who want the original feel and look to go out and enjoy at the range without spending the money on an original collectible. So anyway, there you go. Smith & Wesson Model 18-7 Combat Masterpiece 4-inch 22 revolver. All right, up next I have a Ruger Mini 14 Ranch trifle. These would come onto the scene in 1973 from Sturm Ruger and was really meant to be a scaled down investment cast version of the M14 rifle which was popular at the time. Of course that was 308. This was meant to be 223. Of course you know the, their chambers are marked 223 on the earlier ones. The later ones 556. Five, uh, this is a ranch rifle. Main difference being you have the flip sights and then you have the little grooves for the optic rail which is actually does have one installed right here. The standard capacity on this was 20 rounds but they did make a uh, 30 round detachable magazine from Ruger and their mags are pretty expensive they're typically about the 30 to 35 dollar price point but there are other companies like Metgar that do make more affordable options which do run pretty well. Now these do come in a variety of different configurations with tactical stocks, polymer stocks, wood stocks like this, uh, and they are still manufactured today. The retail price on a brand new one, MSRP is about $1,000, but under normal conditions, you do find them around eight is where they retail. Um, Right now, of course, prices are elevated, so the new ones, I'm seeing on Gun Broker used ones, especially earlier ones. This one was made in 1999, so I'm seeing those go for about 800, and the new ones going for as high as 1,000 plus, depending on the configuration they're in. So these are actually very, very nice rifles, and they do have a lot of uh, places in a lot of people's collections. Uh, there, there definitely is a lot of nostalgia there, as these have been around since the 1970s. Now, of course, uh, the Mini 14 was intended to be used with military and police service, but its main uh, home and purchasing has been found amongst the civilian population, especially here in the United States. So very, very cool rifles. They never last long. There's always buyers on these. I definitely recommend taking a look if you see one available at your local gun store. All right, up next, I have a pretty unique one. This is a Colt Double Eagle. This is a commander size. And this one here has two magazines. Now they would come with a with a single stack magazines. Now Colt would offer this in three sizes: the full size government, the commander, which this is, and the officers. This would come onto the market in 1989 and only last until 1997. Now all of them were in a stainless configuration like this, except for the lightweight commander, which came in an alloy frame and a blued slide. Now pretty much all uh, Colt Double Eagles in all sizes come in 45 ACP and 10 millimeter. There were some 9 millimeters and 40s made, but both of those uh, caliber offerings are pretty uh, uncommon and pretty difficult to source. Now, funny story is back when I had the old uh, weekly or the uh, used guns of the week videos, one of my early ones, I had a full size government 9 millimeter uh, featured in one of those videos, and that one actually we sold for over a thousand dollars. So that one uh, went quite a bit higher than what the 45 ACP versions will bring. Now, this being a commander size N45. With two mags, no box, I would expect on the, the current market to go between about $600 and $650. Of course, if it were a 9mm or specifically a 40, uh, B, it would be uh, worth probably again up in that $900, $1,000, uh, $1,100 range. Now, the 40s they, and the commander and the officers, they only made in 1996, so which was the next to last year of production. So those are actually very uncommon to find uh, 40 officers or commander if you're talking about the Double Eagle. Now, it gets the name Double Eagle because it is a 1911, which is double single action. So, of course, typical 1911s work in a single action configuration and a double action configuration as well. Now this mechanism was designed by Ron Smith of Smith Enterprises, of course, in the 90s. So um, I don't know of any other double single action 1911s out on the market. There probably are some, I am just not aware of them, but that's what makes the Double Eagle very unique. This is also a Series 90 mechanism, so it does have the Series 80 plunger, but being a single stack, um, eight round capacity, double single action, puts it in the series 90, and it also has a decocker here on this side. These are very unique 1911s and always have a place uh, in the collection for any Colt collectors or 1911 collectors, especially due to their just 
their uniqueness as what they are, their firing mechanism. So really, really cool to see these come in and stuff like this does not last long. All right, up next I have somewhat of a classic hunting rifle and a very popular action. This is a Weatherby Mark V. Uh, specifically, this is an ultra lightweight. So we've been over Weatherby bef uh, before on these videos. So Roy Weatherby would start the company in the 1940s and he himself was known as a wildcat loader. So he would take pre-existing cartridges and try to push them to their maximum velocities and chamber pressures that he could get away with. He was also of the philosophy of taking a low caliber projectile and trying to launch it at the fastest velocity he could. So for that, he needed a very robust and very strong action. In about 1957, the Weatherby Mark V would come onto the scene. Now, what would make this action sh so strong is it would use a set of tri-interrupted lugs in the front of the uh, chamber, and it would use a three, it was a, basically a three steel ring system inside the receiver to give it, a, a, you know, that extra rigidity around the chamber. So, known as a very, very strong action. You're also going to notice three chamber ports, which is, very iconic, if you guys can see that right there. Three chamber ports, um, very well known on the Mark V series. You're gonna see that. That was really meant for uh, bleeding off of excess pressures if there was an overloaded casing uh, to prevent from case rupturing and things like that. So uh, very indicative, of course, of the philosophy that Roy Weatherby had in the design. Other features are a 54 degree bolt throw, uh, very, very quick cycling action, very smooth. So. Uh, very strong action, which would rival that of the popular Mauser. Now this does have a Nikon Buckmaster scope on it. For those of you who don't know, Nikon is no longer in the scope manufacturing business, so their products are going up a little bit in value due to that, but uh, they, they have always made nice glass. I wish that they still manufactured optics. I especially like the P308, um, which I have on my Remington 700, so nice optics. Um, Without the scope on it, the unloaded weight on this is about five pounds, 12 ounces. So a very, very light rifle. Of course, also achieved on a light profile a fluted barrel and the bolt itself is also fluted to cut down on that weight. Very uh, slim profile here on the stock. Now new, the Mark V series ranges anywhere from $900 to $1,500 based on the variant you're getting. There's about six different configurations of the Mark V series. And used, of course, they're gonna range anywhere from about, again, $700 to about $1,200. Again, depending on the configuration and you know if you have an optic or anything on there. So very, very nice rifles. Um, again, very, very popular action. Great hunting rifles. This one here is a 30-06. Overall, great. Love to see this type of stuff come in. I'm, I've always been a fan of Weatherby rifles. All right, up uh, next is a really cool one. This is a early HK Mark 23 in its original sort of uh, soft paneled uh, camo case that this would have come in back in the 90s. It's a really, really cool piece. Uh, the HK Mark 23, also the Mark 23 Mod O, as known to some in the military is a 45 ACP, 10 or 12 round capacity, short recoil, double single action handgun. The story on this pistol basically starts in 1989 when US SOCOM was looking at its equipment and wanted to make revisions, especially in the handgun department on their loadout for special operation purposes, obviously, especially in the offensive role. In 1991, the United States military would put out a trials for what they called the Offensive Handgun Weapon System, OHWS, of which HK would submit the Mark 23, essentially, uh, which later would be adopted as the Mark 23 Mod O. The whole philosophy behind this was to have a handgun that in and of itself could serve as a primary weapon. You had, again, 45 ACP. At the time, the M9 was standard issue in the military. It was to get more knockdown power, more stopping power, especially something that was uh, subsonic that could be issued with a suppressor. And typically, you know, the, the standard uh, configuration of this was with a suppressor and an assisted uh, sighting system, which is really just a laser system. The kit here includes a spot for the laser. No, that was for the laser. This is for the suppressor. So you could get the kit completed out with all that stuff. This did not come with that. Now, this would, of course, have a lot of popularity as well with law enforcement and the civilian market. And in 1996, HK would release the Mark 23, not the, you know, dropping the motto designation, which is what the military called it, to the civilian market. Now, this particular one was actually made in 1998. So it's a second year production of the Mark 23. Now, in 2010, uh, HK would discontinue the Mark 23, 
which would cause these to explode in value. And then subsequently, a few years ago, they re-released the Mark 23, which brought them down a little bit. Currently today, you can get a new production Mark 23 for about $2,000 to $2,200, but they are actually not, they do not make them in very high numbers, so they are pretty difficult to uh, to get. In fact, we got one on allocation in the past, uh, past six years. Now, this particular one is in like new condition. Now, like Glocks or most other semi-automatic handguns, and I'll bring this in, typically you get wear lines right here on top of the barrel. This does not even have that. So this thing is like 99%, probably, I would even say like new. I am not sure it's even been fired. It is in pristine condition. Um, in this condition, the original ones with this original box, and of course, because this was made in 1998 during the assault weapons ban here in the United States, it did come with two 10 round magazines, which this does have with it. Uh, you know, in this configuration, they're going, you know, $2,000, $2,500 and up. So, you know, depending on the collectors that are looking for it. Has all of its original paperwork, instruction manuals. So just a really, really cool collector's piece, especially for those people interested in the Mark 23. Now the Mark 23 has a huge place in especially 1990s pop culture. So the Metal Gear, Gear Solid uh, PlayStation franchise video game, very popular. That was the the uh, you know traditionally you see Solid Snake using the Mark 23 with the uh, with the laser and the suppressor on it. Uh, also used in myriad different uh, films such as Tears of the Sun and others that came out in the 90s and early 2000s. So huge, really really cool, respected firearm. I uh, really love to see these come in, and this would actually be the second Mark 23 I've ever had. Of course, the first one being that new one we got two or three years ago, so very, very cool. All right, last but definitely not least is this, the LMT LM308 MWS. MWS meaning Modular Weapon System, 308 AR-10 platform from Lewis Machine and Tool. So the story on this would start in 2009 with the British in Iraq and Afghanistan. So in 2009, the British uh, Ministry of Defense would put out a request for a new DMR, designated marksman's rifle, which would serve in support or alongside the Accuracy International L96 that the British were using at the time. Now, because of deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, both the British and the Americans learned very quickly that the close and urban type of combat situations, it was not good to be the guy stuck with a bolt action rifle like the L96. What they wanted is something that could offer performance and touch targets out to 800 plus meters and 308, but also have that capability to get out of a tight situation should the operator need to use it for close quarter, quick target transition, uh, transition target type of circumstances, which is typically what you're going to uh, potentially find yourself in in an urban combat type of environment. So LMT would answer the call and come to the table with this, which the British would adopt as the L129A1, okay? And it would go into British service and it's still being used today. Now, in that configuration, it's a little bit different than this, where they had the uh, FDE furniture. This is the SOT mod stock from, um, from LMT. Heavy profile barrel. One cool thing is the barrels are interchangeable and can be changed out at the user level. Uh, you had a singular uh, monolithic piece of rail up here at the top. The receiver halves are, again, 70-75 T6 aircraft-grade aluminum, which you're going to typically find in ARs. There is no forward assist. That was a feature that was left off. Now, LMT is an American-based arms manufacturer, and we as Americans do have an interest in purchasing firearms that sort of have that military type of affiliation. We see this with Colt products, HK products, uh, where we basically get civilian, you know, barrel length, legal, semi-automatic only versions of military rifles, a Steyr AUG. You know, that's the type of thing that a lot of collectors and buyers in the United States like. Firearms build up a rep reputation with our military service, and we as civilians like to get as close as we can to those offerings. So LMT did come out with this exact package. Again, the LM308 MWS, which is a carbon copy, the exact same rifle that the British are issuing as the L129A1, save for a few differences. And those are basically the British versions issued with FTE type furniture. Of course, you have the optic, you have the British roll markings, but beyond that, it is exactly the same rifle.
Now these would retail in about the two to three thousand dollar range plus depending on if it comes with the original box uh, what optic you have on it stuff like that so there is definitely again collectors in this type of stuff lmt is known for making very high-end firearms that are up there with knight's armament uh, of course i put them higher than daniel defense and bcm uh, just a very very nice high grade high quality firearms well that is all the time i have for you today on these thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video if you enjoyed please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, if you want to see more content like this, remember we post these videos every single week. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on that bell notification. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.